So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I'm really pleased that all of you were able to make it here this morning. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I want to apologize to you folks in advance. I seem to be coming down with a little bit of a cold. So uh, I beg your forgiveness if uh, <clears throat> my uh, speech is a little bit uh, slowed down. Um, Anyway, uh, my name is Leslie Hawthorne, and I believe I know some of you folks from my time at Google when I was managing the Summer of Code program. Do we have any Summer of Code mentors and students here? If you could raise your hands. Woohoo! All right. We'll be hanging out and having a beer later. That's going to be great. Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk to you this morning about cultivating community, uh, how to make your project blossom. So we'll be talking a bit about what community is, what it's not, some best practices for building your community, and we'll also be going through a case study of a project that I think gets community really right. So before we get started, um, I want to say a great big thank you to all the folks who made it possible for us to be here today at Berlin Buzzwords, all of the sponsors, the program committee, all of the volunteers who put everything together, the folks who took care of travel and logistics. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today, and we wouldn't all be able to be here together without those folks. So let's give them a round of applause, please. Um, for those who may uh, not be familiar with the image that you're seeing right now, this is an outline of the great state of Portland, Oregon. Uh, I flew in yesterday morning from Portland so that I could join you folks here today. Uh, has anyone seen the TV show Portlandia? All right, so it's kind of true. Um, I got to tell you, it's, it's a little scary. There are really people who wax their handlebar mustaches like they live in the 1890s. It's all very thrilling. So uh, this is my long-winded way of telling you folks that if you should find yourself in Portland for uh, OSCON or any of the other many open source conventions that are held in Portland, it would be great to see you folks. Please let me know when you'll be in town and I will take you out to any of Portland's fabulous brew pubs. Uh, the Oregonians take their beer very seriously, not as serious as the German folks do, but we'll at least make sure you have a good time. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, for those folks who are a bit less familiar with my background, just to let you folks know why I'm here today talking about community and why I'm passionate about community, um, I've been working in the open source software space for about six years, got my start managing the Google Summer of Code program, spent some time at the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, which some folks in the audience might know about because we host the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, and now I am at Red Hat in the community action and impact space, helping to make our upstream projects wildly successful. So um, I'm all about community stuff, mentorship, helping to bring in new contributors, and generally making open source more awesome. So today's path, or our agenda. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk uh, first about what is community, a little bit about what it is, what it's not, how to think about community. Uh, then I'll be going, moving into a section on best practices called the community as a garden. And we'll be looking at best practices for managing your community and making it grow and thrive through the metaphor of community as a garden. And finally, blossoming projects, we'll be looking at one particular project in depth uh, and how it manages to do community quite well. So getting started, what is community? Um, I actually find the term community to be fairly problematic. Uh, we use the term community to apply to many different things. For some folks, it's their close friends and their family. For some folks, it's their neighbors. For some folks, it's the people who reside with them in a particular nation or however they affiliate themselves with their heritage. Uh, for some folks, community is about all the, group, uh, all the folks in a particular group that they get together and volunteer with, such as folks in the open source community. Um, and yet, when you hear the word community, we all have an idea in our heads of what community means, but it means so many different things to different people that when we start talking about community and trying to understand how we're working together toward common goals, uh, it actually becomes a bit more complex. So when I was preparing this keynote, I thought, okay, I want more than anything, I want to define community so that we are all on the same page about what we're discussing. And I tried to think of the characteristics that define the open source community. And the first thing that I came up with, seemed fairly obvious, was, well, the open source community believes in the sharing of source code, right? Duh. That's why there's all these wonderful licenses that tell you how you can and can't use the software. Except that definition really isn't sufficient, right? Uh, the sharing of source code doesn't actually capture all of the other work that goes into making a free software project successful. 
Uh, think about all the folks who are doing QA, who are doing releases, documentation, user experience design. All of that work goes into making a project successful. So the open source community is not just a group of people who believes in the sharing of code. A lot of folks, I think, look at the open source community and tend to think that we sort of, uh, in this very uh, overarching way, believe in the value of, um, that we share a common value system, right? That we really, really care about uh, the world being more awesome. And yet, if we look at our common value system, we have the eternal debate of free software versus open source. And when you consider that that's actually a very fundamental question of your personal value system, I don't even necessarily know that as a community we agree very effectively on that vector either. So, well, we often tend to think of free software as an army of volunteers who are working really, really hard to make a particular project better. So, I don't know that that's entirely accurate these days either, as we've seen more and more businesses make use of free software as part of their business model. Most folks that I know now are paid to work on open source. I've actually been paid to work on open source ever since I got involved in the community about six years ago. Um, how many folks in the audience are paid to work on open source as part of their day job? Okay, it's a great show of hands. For those of you who just raised your hands and said that you work on open source for part of your day job, um, how many of you have found that you've spent less time doing volunteer con contributions to open source now that you're paid to work on open source? Okay, you guys are awesome. Usually I see a sea of hands when I ask a question like that. Um, if folks are interested in that particular topic, uh, Stormy Peters with the Mozilla Foundation has given a great speech called Would You Do It Again for Free about the interplay between uh, financing of open source projects and developer spirit. Well worth checking out if that's of interest to you. So, after going through all of these definitions of community that seemed to me to be kind of a no-brainer and then sort of teasing them out and realizing that it wasn't quite as simple as that, I came to the conclusion that one way we could really define the open source community was by saying we all like to scratch our own itch, right? That's the one thing that I think characterizes all the folks that I've met who work in free and open source software. We're all motivated to make things better because we have a personal need and we want to see that need addressed and we're willing to share the solution with other folks in case they find it useful. But what I think is very interesting about that key common characteristic is when we're talking about community, the concept of scratching your own itch is very, uh, it's very much about the self and the needs of the individual, whereas a community is about many people coming together to accomplish things. So again, I'm still sort of struggling with how we can best define community. So I came up with this definition. Community is a group of people working together toward a common goal. Seems fairly obvious. But what I think that we all need to do in order to make sure that we have very effective, healthy communities is be very aware of the fact that a community is made up of individuals with their own motivations, their own desires for success, and their own expectations about what they need to be getting out of being a participant in a particular community. And if we want our communities to be truly healthy and to be truly successful, we need to find a way that those individual needs are met and individual voices are heard while still making sure that everyone is moving forward effectively towards that common goal. And that can actually be a very difficult process, particularly when we're thinking about community in terms of a global audience. Um, how many folks are here from Germany? Okay, quite a few hands. How many folks are here from the European Union? How many folks are here from the United States? Okay, how many folks are here from Africa? Okay, how many folks are here from South America? No Brazilians? I love the Brazilians. Okay, well, that's all right. Pardon? I'm sorry, I have a cold, you're right. How, how many folks are here from Asia? All right, woohoo! So we're all here, we've all come together, and we all need to think about the need to, to rationalize our own individual motivations and desires with the, needs to meet our, uh, the need to meet the needs of our community. So how can we do that effectively? I actually think that the most effective way to make this happen is actually the telling of stories. Um, I think that when we think about the open source community, we think about uh, tools. We think about things like source code. We think about things like version control. We think about things like going to great events like these. 
But how many of you in the audience have learned more about the way your code base functions and the way that your community gets things done and group processes and group dynamics by talking to each other and listening to each other's stories? I know I have. Um, I actually find that I am a much better user of a piece of software after I've met the developer team because I know how they think and I can intuit how I should use the software based on understanding how they thought about the problem that they were solving. By taking the time to share these stories amongst ourselves, and particularly with folks who may be newer to our communities, we're actually cementing the bonds of that community simply through the telling of these stories, right? We're helping people to understand what has happened in the past, why decisions were made a certain way, and in the act of actually telling those stories, you invite the participant who's listening to you to become a part of that story. You're showing how things got done, and therefore, going through this process is immediately accessible to anyone, right? We're all people. We can all work hard. We can all meet challenges. So in the telling of those histories and in the telling of those stories, we're actually able to really focus folks to, uh, into working together on that common goal simply by creating that feeling of tribalism, that feeling of a community bond through stories, right? When we're children, what do we, do, what do we have? We have evening story time. That importance of that, that project lore, that cultural history, that sense of shared heritage is equally important as we move into adulthood and into our work in the open source community. Um, I apologize, I'm going to go off on a mini rant here. Uh, so, tools do not a community make. Um, how many of you folks have noticed that the term community is now being applied to just about everything, including, I don't know, breakfast cereal? Okay, a couple, I see a couple hands in the audience. Uh, I think that we, uh, as uh, you know, folks who think about community matters, I know when I first started doing work in um, software community management five years ago, the term community manager was kind of new. People kind of didn't know what community managers did. They just knew that they were those awesome people who kind of made things happen behind the scenes and made sure that like the coffee never ran out. So you really loved your community manager, but you didn't really understand what they were all about. Um, now, fast forward to 2012, and I've talked to some folks who are in the community space and they tell me that their community is their Facebook group. Does anyone else see anything wrong with that as a definition of community? I think of Facebook as a tool. I don't think of a uh, Facebook group as being a community. A community is that group of people who gets together and shares, be it source code, be it recipes in a particular Facebook group. But I think the concept of conflating community with a particular set of tools can be actually really damaging to that definition of community. If one particular tool goes away, does that mean your community no longer exists? And I think that that can be particularly problematic. So as folks are thinking about community-minded matters, I'd urge folks to abstract away the concept of tooling as really being what defines their communities. However, tools are very much a guide to the community that uses them. So if we take a look at this photo and contrast it with this one, tools are clean, they're beautiful, they're laid out in a very organized fashion. We can either assume this person never gardens, or we can assume that they take their craft very seriously and that they're always at the ready and they keep their tools sharp, clean, and ready to go. Versus this, you've got a trowel that's all bent, stuff is rusty. I'm not sure I would want to garden with this person, right? They don't think they really take things seriously. They don't clean up after themselves. Maybe they're doing a suboptimal job. They're not as dedicated. The reason that I'm bringing up this point is that it is very important for us to realize that the tools that we use and how we use them is very much a reflection of who our communities are. So it's always worthwhile to take a moment to have some introspection and to consider what kind of face we're putting forward as a community to the outside world, particularly when we want our communities to grow and thrive and bring in new contributors. So if you find that, for example, you're having, say, arguments in the issue tracker over a particular bug, maybe that's not the best place to have those arguments. Um, it's just, uh, here's another great example. If you are actually someone who is a, a new person and you come to a project and you find that they're using CVS for version control, what is your first thought? 
run away. <laughs> run away screaming with both eyes closed. Um, or to put it more kindly, uh, perhaps you, you come to the realization that this is a very mature code base and that changes to it are complex. So maybe that isn't necessarily where you want to spend your time. So to bring this point back full circle, a community is not the sum of its tools, but our tools are very much a reflection of who we are as community members. So think about the tools that you're using and how you use them and what kind of face that presents to the outside world as you're looking to bring new contributors into your project. Last but not least, one final note on community. Uh, thriving communities are not homogeneous. Thriving communities are diverse entities. And I think that as folks working in the open source world, we tend to think of ourselves as a diverse set of people, right? We have folks from all over the world in this room. And I don't think that that's necessarily common in many other disciplines. We're very fortunate in that. But as you're looking at ways to make your community grow and prosper, it's important to bring folks into the fold who aren't necessarily like you, right? So if you have a whole group of developers working on a project, that's great. Where are your user experience folks? Where are your designers? Where are your folks with a more varied set of skills and talents? So think about that as you're thinking about ways to make your community more effective. If you look around in your community garden and all of the flowers are the same color and the same height, that's probably not a good thing. Monoculture is bad in, in agriculture and monoculture is bad for our communities. So to make your community thrive, make a concerted effort to encourage a diversity of opinions and that you have many different types of contributors coming in because they'll be able to better uh, inform how to solve particular problems because everyone isn't thinking in exactly the same fashion. So getting into our next topic, the community as a garden. As I mentioned earlier on in this presentation, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at some best practices for community management through the lens of community as garden. Um, I was introduced to the metaphor of community as a garden um, actually by one of my colleagues at Red Hat, Karsten Wade, whose job title was community gardener. And I thought that was cool and pretty cute. You know, I like my organic garden at home. It's very exciting. And I thought that was, you know, nifty. Of course I like gardening. I'm from California. I'm a hippie, right? And, uh, and then I thought about it and I realized that was an incredibly astute metaphor for a community. That's a group of <clears throat> non-homogeneous entities that come together to make a beautiful whole. So let's examine some best practices through the lens of community as garden. So first and foremost, you have to cultivate your community. I know that this seems like a very obvious point, but I think that we tend to uh, think of that social stuff as maybe slightly less significant work in our communities than all of the great work that needs to happen to produce software. And great communities don't just happen by accident. They're the product of diligent work by various folks trying to make sure that everyone works together well. And I don't know, how many of you have uh, gotten involved in private conversations? Maybe there's a heated discussion happening in your IRC channel and someone kind of pulls you out and says, okay, let's come to consensus, let's all calm down, let's not have this argument. How often has that happened to you? I know it's happened to me a few times. Okay, I'm seeing a couple of hands. Without those folks doing that, that hard social work behind the scenes, or even um, publicly, your community is simply not going to thrive. Good communities don't happen by accident. There is a real concerted effort to make good communities successful. And we'll talk about some of those ways to make your community successful in the next few slides. So I think the first step in making sure that your community is able to grow and thrive is to define your landscape specifically to define your goals for your project and your non-goals. What are you not trying to achieve? This is useful not just for the purpose of making sure that your team is operating effectively and again, trying to push forward to that common goal. If you haven't articulated your common goals, it's going to be very hard to push toward them together. And it's also important to let the outside world know what is important to you, what your values are. As you're looking to bring in new contributors, having a very specific and concrete mission statement or set of goals and non-goals helps people to very quickly and effectively understand if your project is the right place for their contributions and their needs and their interests. Uh, I think one of my favorite examples of this uh, was, um, how many folks have read Producing Open Source Software by Carl Fogel? Seeing a few hands. 
If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Check it out. It's um, one of the most valuable pieces of literature I've read on the process of uh, free software communities. So Carl Fogel was one of the early committers to the Subversion Project. And he also did most, most of the community management functions for those folks. And they all as a team, the original developers, decided to come together and define a mission statement because they recognized the importance of getting everybody together and moving toward the same common goal. And they decided that their mission statement was that subversion is meant to be a compelling replacement for CVS. Okay, fair enough. About two months into the project, they had someone show up on their mailing list just rabidly furious saying, why are you off in a corner doing this new thing? I don't get it. You guys should be working on CVS and fixing CVS. This is a waste of time. You're doing it wrong. No bueno. We don't like it. And they were actually able to have a really effective dialogue with this individual because they simply pointed to their mission statement and said, it is our goal to provide a compelling replacement for CVS. If you're interested in improving CVS, we wish you well on your quest. We're excited for you. That's not our goal. And rather than having you know, 20 minutes of, uh, or probably 20 years, of flame fests over that topic, everyone was able to move on in a very non-confrontational way because there was simply a fact-based discussion. That is not our mission. That's not what we want to do. By clearly articulating your goals and your non-goals, you're not only making it possible for your team to work together most effectively, you're also making folks who come into your project aware of what they're going to expect when they get there, what they're going to get out of their contribution, and why it may or may not be important for them to be there. So after you've defined your landscape and set your goals and your non-goals, the next thing you need to do is assess your landscape. If you've been involved with a project for a really long time, you know everything there is to know about being in that particular project community and how to get things done. It's the same thing that you, same way you have memorized the pathway to your front door and you can walk to your front door and get into your building with your eyes closed. But someone who's never been there before, they might, you know, not remember that there's a third step up to your door and they might trip and fall. Similarly, when we're talking about our um, assessing our communities, we need to take that time to be introspective and think about, like, are we actually as welcoming as we would like to be? Um, how, many of, how many times have you gotten into a particular IRC channel and the banter that was going on there was just kind of not very useful or sort of offensive? Okay, seeing, seeing a few hands. Um, consider, again, we talked a bit about how tools are a reflection of the community that uses them. Again, these tools are a reflection of the community that uses them. If you, you want to make sure that your mailing list chatter is useful, you want to make sure that you are kindly pointing folks to the right resources and not telling them to read the fabulous manual, because that doesn't really help anybody. Um, I actually had the most interesting experience recently when I joined Red Hat about two months ago. My first task that I set for myself was to read my team's entire mailing list archive. So this is four months of email. It's not a lot. Four months. Two weeks later, and my eyes having small uh, holes burned in them from staring at the screen for too long, um, I realized just how difficult it is when we give newbies the advice of go read the mailing list. Like, how, how often have you heard folks give that to somebody as advice? Oh, you need to know about that, just go search the mailing list archives, it's all in there. Do you have any idea how hard that stuff is to find? First, you have to know the right search terms, you have to know the right people involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure that when you're looking to bring new contributors into your project that you're giving them as much help as possible so that they can be successful and not expecting them to just be able to assess the landscape on their own. You as a project team put together that landscape and you want to make sure that it's actually possible for folks to move forward and be successful. So again, on the topic of assessing the landscape, you want to make all paths to success clear. Um, how many times have you gone to a particular project's web page and gotten really excited about what they were doing and then you went to you know, go download the source code and six clicks later you were taken to a source for download page that didn't have the same name as the project name and you couldn't actually get the source from the mirror. I know this has happened to me. Okay, seeing a few hands, great. Not, not the only one who's had this problem. So as you're organizing the information for your project, make your paths to success clear. If you don't have your resources clearly linked from your website, no one's going to be able to, to help you out 
with the work that you're doing, nor are they going to use your software. Um, if you want to, uh, here's another great example. How often have you rejected patches from your free software project due to style constraints, but there's no style guide? I'm hearing some laughter. Okay, so this has happened. Think about how, uh, how frustrating that must be for the person who, who's come and volunteered their time and really wants to work with you. And they're a new person, so they know all the things that you've already forgotten. Like, there's no style guide, so I can't actually successfully provide you with this patch. That's, that's just, that's, that's a bummer. No one wants to be in that position, right? So as you're organizing your community's activities, make all paths to success abundantly clear. As, as, uh, as you go through the process of lowering frustration for new folks who come in, lowering the barrier to entry, you'll find that you get that much more out of your contributors, and you'll find that people stick around longer and more, are more enthusiastic about participating. Just one moment, please. So, um, how many folks in this room got involved in an open source project because they were looking for a particular technical solution and then found a project online and thought, wow, this is great, I'm totally going to volunteer? Okay, see a few hands. How many of you got involved in a particular open source project because a buddy of yours said, hey, you should totally check out such and such, it's awesome, I'm already working on it, and you should work on it too? I usually see about double the hands when I ask that question, okay. I'm in a room full of super smart cookies. So, when you're thinking about going through the process of strengthening your community and growing it, you actually have to go through the work of inviting people to join you. Um, I know that for some folks in the free software community, the concept of marketing makes them uh, slightly ill. Um, but if you're not actually doing the, the good work of telling folks what you're doing in an effective fashion and asking them very specifically to come and contribute, you're losing out on the opportunity to gain contributors, to get more hands to help you with the work. And I also want to give folks the, the piece of advice that it's very important to make specific asks of people when you're looking for folks to help you out. A general call for volunteers is wonderful, but there are only certain people who are going to respond to a general call for volunteers. What I've found to be incredibly effective is to send out a general call for volunteers, for example, hey, we need folks to help us uh, organize Berlin buzzwords, and then to reach out to individual folks who you know have particular skills and talents and ask them to use those in the, in the, uh, in the service of your project. So, for example, um, my friends at the World Forge project, uh, they were really bummed out because they're like, our software is unattractive and we need artists to work with us to make our uh, project more visually appealing. And furthermore, we're tired of being just a bunch of coders sitting around doing this work. We feel like we don't have the kind of input we need to be most successful. So rather than just posting a note on the World Forge homepage saying, we need artists, because, you know, all the artists who are already not there are totally going to read that notice on the front page and know you need help with art. That's not actually going to happen. Um, instead, these folks did specific targeted outreach to art artists, people that they knew, individuals who were their friends, and said, I know that you're very talented at doing such and such and such and such. It would be really helpful and beneficial to us if you could give us some of your time to, you know, work on a logo or design specific pieces of artwork for us that'll be included in this World Forge project, and we think that you'd be the perfect person to do it. Will you please help us with this task? And making those specific asks of individuals to contribute to your project, that's this huge motivator, right? Someone actually, someone has recognized that you're good at something, they've taken the time to tell you that they recognize your accomplishments, and that your accomplishments are so wonderful that you want them to join in the work that you're doing. So, but you want them to join in something you're passionate about. It doesn't matter how great the software you write is, it doesn't matter how great your contribution infrastructure may be or how well articulated all of your paths to success are. If you don't actually specifically go out and invite folks to join you, you're going to find that your community is not as strong or as diverse as you might want it to be. Ah, useful advice. In your community garden, you want to pluck out your weeds, and you want to do this early and often, and especially at the start of things. Um, how many folks uh, have their favorite uh, troll horror story? I have mine. I have several favorite troll horror stories. Or stories about poisonous people in a particular community? 
Are folks familiar with the term poisonous people? See some nods, that's great. So poisonous people are the folks who come into your project and derail conversations and generally don't help, get peop get, help people get things done. Um, I tend to think of these people as the eternally cranky. No matter what decision you make, they're not going to like it, and they're going to let you know loudly that they don't like it. Um, these are also the people who never show up to volunteer for anything, which is kind of a bummer. So as you're worrying about the process of making your community a better place to be, take the time to, to excise those weeds, right? These are people who are taking vital oxygen and vital nutrients out of your community garden soil and wasting it by being non-productive. And I know that this is actually really hard, right? Human beings tend to not like confrontation. I know I'm not a huge fan. And it's also sometimes difficult because the folks involved don't really know that they're being counterproductive. They just think that they're trying to express their opinion freely. And so take care of those problems early and often because if bad behavior begins in your community and it is not sanctioned and no one has a discussion with the person who is not behaving in a constructive manner, you're sending a message to your community that bad behavior is tolerated. And bad behavior simply begets additional bad behavior. So if you have someone in your community who's being counterproductive, who's being insulting, who's being unkind, who's being generally uh, not someone you'd want to spend a lot of time with, for example, that's okay. Let them know that you've really appreciated the time that you've spent together, but that the time has now passed, and that you wish them well on their quest, and that there are many other wonderful places for them to be, just not right here. Nurturing your seedlings. As I said on the previous slide, uh, getting rid of your weeds in your garden is particularly important at the start of things. When you're planting your garden uh, and you have your brand new little tiny baby plants, um, if there are a bunch of weeds in your garden, they're gonna choke them out. Your little baby plants aren't going to live. All their nutrients are gonna be taken away. It's not great. Similarly, how often do you find that folks in your community who may be those trolls or unproductive people immediately seize on the new persons who come in because the new person doesn't realize that they're a pain in the rear end? Or because you all have them on slash ignore, but the newbie doesn't? Not, maybe this trend in open source has stopped, and that would be really awesome. Okay, I didn't see any hands on that, so woohoo, life is improving. Um, so frequently I have found um, that and, and this has actually happened to me, like some of the most outgoing, charismatic, and immediately attentive people to newcomers to a project are these folks who are trolls, right? They have uh, nothing better to do than to sort of sit around and say, I want to be involved, I want to be involved, and then to be incredibly counterproductive. So as you find new people coming into your project, if you don't want them to step in the troll mine, remember, pluck your weeds, take good care of your seedlings. Similarly, just realize that as new folks come into your project, they're going to need more help. Uh, we're all busy people. We're all experts in our particular field. Sometimes it can be particularly frustrating uh, dealing with, you know, kind of new, newbie questions, right? Just bear in mind that this, this too shall pass. This is a process. Uh, eventually your seedlings will grow into healthy, strong plants that don't need all of that extra attention and time and watering and care and feeding but make sure to spend that time at the outset. It's a worthwhile investment to make. Practice companion planting. Um, for folks in the audience who may not be familiar with the term companion planting, it's the concept of planting certain plants together in the garden so that both plants uh, thrive better. So in this example, we have marigolds planted with chard and poppy. So poppy helps to attract bees, which makes all the plants happy. Marigolds also, um, keep away pests like yucky nematodes in the soil and uh, they also tend to repel insects that like to eat your delicious delicate swish chard. <clears throat> so by planting all of these plants together, they all are able to work together more effectively and thrive. It's the same thing in our communities, right? If we want people to be most successful, we need to make sure that we're pairing them with the right folks to make them successful. Um, I noticed that several folks earlier in the audience raised their hands and mentioned that they'd participated in the Summer of Code program. I found that during my four years managing the program, the most successful participants in that mentorship program were the people who very early on in the process, typically before the program was even announced for the year, were thinking about how they could best pair up their available mentors with 
potential students. So what were particular mentor skills and talents? I had one group that came to me with this pretty amazing spreadsheet that had things on it like name, time zone, preferred method of communication, IRC, email or voice, um, available hours during the day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that when they had students, newcomers, um, come in to contribute to their project, they were able to do that kind of granular matching to see, you know, to make sure that their students would be most successful. They actually even um, asked their student, uh, would-be student participants about their particular learning style. So are you an auditory learner? Are you better at reading documentation? What makes you most effective? And then there were cases where mentors would literally switch out later uh, because they found that their student was working much more effectively with someone who would uh, do voice communications with them, whereas the mentor was much more uh, comfortable with uh, IRC chat. And lo and behold, the student immediately improved because they were getting that same kind of reinforcement and knowledge sharing in a way that was useful to them. Excuse me. Last but not least, best practices for community management. Know when to prune. Um, I've talked to a lot of folks in many different communities over the years, and uh, there's a lot of nervousness and general anxiety around uh, community growth. Because as a project gets to be uh, more mature, there's eventually this tipping point where uh, the newcomers and folks who haven't been involved uh, with the project for a long time come in, and they tend to outweigh the old guard. Right? There are now more new people than there are people who have been here forever. On the one hand, that's a great problem to have. Your project is growing, it's thriving, new folks are coming in, that's wonderful. On the other hand, it can be very difficult because uh, folks who have been in the project for a really long time have, can have very set opinions about how things should be done, how processes should work, why things are done a certain way. And sometimes those are great reasons and sometimes they're more about the comfort of the familiar and what we know that we've already experienced. So just as with plants you, uh, who uh, grow more effectively through pruning, right, by cutting off some of the old dead growth, new uh, leaves are able to sprout, increased foliage is able to come out, and the plant is actually made healthier because all of that new foliage helps the plant to perform photosynthesis and be healthier and make additional nutrients for itself. So too, when we're thinking about our approach to our communities, we need to know when it's okay to let go and when it's okay to move on. Um, I've talked to numerous folks in particular communities that are growing who they're very nervous, they're very upset that their old timers are leaving. They feel like somehow they've failed. Uh, they feel like they haven't shown uh, an appropriate amount of welcoming or respect to the folks who actually got the project started. And again, as we're thinking about our community as a garden, it's completely common for these things to happen. There is growth, there is die-off, there is constant change, but the garden remains. Likewise, if you're someone who's an old-timer in a particular project and you're trying to think through, um, you know, if you find yourself, uh, I like to call it having arguments with the youngins, if you find yourself having a bunch of arguments with your new folks about how things ought to get done and why things are the way they are, it's time to take a moment to be introspective. Are you really truly passionate about what you're doing? Are you making arguments about uh, processes because of what you're familiar with? Or are you making arguments about processes because you know this is the one right way forward? And if you find that this isn't you know, something that you're super excited about, that's OK. It's OK to move on. Again, this is part of the natural cycle of communities. People come, people go, things ebb and flow. So we've talked a bit about some best practices for managing your community and how to make your community grow and thrive. And I'd just like to, to cap this section off by just pointing out uh, cultivating community is very hard work. Um, I just you know, rattled off you know, about 15 to 20 different types of best practices and examples of how um, you know, to think about those in your project. And that's a lot of information, right? And I mean, the, the, the process of health checking your community and making sure that it's working effectively uh, could fill an entire book. And now that I think about it, I'm going to write that book because I've always wanted to write a book. Thank you all for inspiring me. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is, yeah, it's a lot of hard work to build a, a good community. And that's OK, because it's incredibly rewarding. And it's the toughest job you'll ever love. So I promised that first we would talk a bit about what is community, best practices for managing your community. 
And I'd like to conclude today's keynote by talking about uh, one particular project that I think gets community really right. So we're, we're going to be looking at a case study on how to make your project blossom now through the, uh, discussing one project that I've been following since 2006. And these folks are the Open MRS project. Um, have anybody in the audience uh, followed the humanitarian free and open source software movement? Oh, folks. Okay, that's okay. We're going to talk about it later, and I will get you all inspired to contribute to HBOS, and that's going to be awesome. Um, so the Open MRS project stands for, it stands for Open Medical Record System. And the purpose of the Open MRS project is to provide electronic healthcare records and patient tracking and monitoring and statistics collection and analytics for patients who are receiving care for HIV in Africa. Uh, this project started out of Indiana University in the United States. And um, it was, uh, the project founders were actually uh, research physicians who also happened to write open source software by night. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm intimidated every time I talk to them. And I wish we were all quite that smart and gifted and talented. So these folks, in addition to creating a, uh, an incredible software suite that uh, has, in fact, been re-imported from Eastern Africa and is now being deployed at several uh, clinics, uh, community clinics, for uh, working with folks who are low income, which I realize, talking to all the Europeans in the audience, this means nothing to you because you have a say in healthcare system. But I digress. Um, in addition to these folks writing this really great code base and helping to give service to the, the poorest of the poor in Africa, um, they've actually done some other really amazing things, right? So this is an academic project that has grown wildly successful. And um, I don't know about your experience, but I found it's about a 50-50 split. Open source projects started in academia either do really well or pff, die on the vine entirely. And I think it's harder for academics sometimes to be involved in open source and free software, at least that's been my experience in the States. Um, they've also really been on the forefront of pushing in in innovation in the medical informatics space. Um, these group of folks were some of the first folks to really push forward the HL7 uh, data protocol for the interchange of health informatics records in a way that is both um, useful in uh, low resource environments, so places where you don't have a lot of power or a lot of bandwidth, um, and also in a way where the patient data remains secure. And in addition to that, they've also created numerous economic development opportunities for folks in Africa, and that was a, sta a stated goal of their mission, was to build capacity among the local communities that they were serving. Um, I don't, has anybody done any study of the process of foreign aid going to Africa and some of the social dynamics behind that? Okay, so just to give a quick summary, um, there are, there's a, a, a fair amount of mistrust in, uh, in Africa when folks come in and say, we have this great new idea and we want to help you solve all of your problems. And the experience very frequently has been some folks show up from the outside, they have a great idea, they have a budget, and they really want to help people. And then two years later when their grant expires, they disappear their work is half done. They had a great idea that didn't really map to the needs of the community because they were coming in from the outside and uh, uh, imposing their system of thought on the local community. And it's created a lot of, of tension and some resentment there. The project leadership was very aware of this dynamic, having worked in the aid space for a long time and from um, actually this being a long lineage of work that their parents had been doing in Africa long before they started this work themselves. And so they actually specifically went to the governments of various nations in Africa and said, how can we help you to make, build local capacity? Is this project useful to you? Will this make your life better? And they actually found that by simply having that kind of dialogue, that, that one, that lack of trust was broken down, which is, I think is a incredibly compelling story, but they also worked out a system to uh, work with, first it started with the government of Rwanda, then it moved on to Kenya, and I believe there are three or four more countries who are signing on to this program, where the government funded training courses for students at the local universities who were studying ICT, and funded their training to become uh, OpenMRS developers. So these folks are now contributing to the code base. They have incredibly good paying jobs in their local community. That economic uh, imp uh, impact is being felt 
throughout the local community as opposed to folks coming in from the outside with dollars and kind of parachuting in and trying to make things better. And that local capacity means that the folks in these clinics, be they urban or rural, are receiving that much better care because there's somebody who is available to answer those questions who is local and who is working in real time. So in addition to writing great software, these people have had a huge uh, beneficial impact on the world in general. They've also experienced just phenomenal growth. Um, this photo here with all the folks in all the brightly colored t-shirts, uh, which I have to admit I like better than the black t-shirts, this is the year that I uh, attended the OpenMRS annual conference. And for just from this photo to this photo two years later, the developer team has doubled in size. And in fact, if I remember correctly, for this group photo where you see so many more folks at the 2011 conference, um, half of the people who were supposed to be in that group photo had already had to leave uh, for their flight to get home. So I think that this phenomenal growth is the result not only of having a very compelling mission and wanting to make the world a better place beyond simply through the writing of this software, but because these folks have really tried hard to make their community a welcoming and beautiful place. Let's talk a little bit about how they've done that. So first of all, uh, they were very good about setting explicit goals and non-goals from the start. So one of the things that the project leadership decided that they wanted to do was focus their efforts solely in providing uh, medical records for use in the developing world, specifically focused on patients who have HIV. Um, there was an opportunity for there to be a commercial play. Uh, open source e electronic health records has now become a very big business, but they decided they did not want to become distracted with having a commercial play for their software. They wanted it to be a goal that economic development would be possible in Africa, but they themselves were not interested in pursuing a commercial distribution. They were much more interested in uh, ameliorating the ills of folks in Africa. And they also, meant, as I mentioned before, had a very clearly articulated strategy to add value in the local community. That was one of their explicit goals. And I think that that outreach to the local community and the, the focus on users and implementers and developers, not just on the development community, but also the people using the software and the folks who are maintaining these systems, allowed that community to grow quickly because by bifurcating those efforts, people were able to get the knowledge and instruction they needed in a very clear way without having to filter out things that were noise for them. And then they were very clearly asked, the next time this question comes up, since now you know the answer, will you please answer it the next time to help us build this community? Um, they had uh, dedicated resources for community management. Of course, I'm going to think that's a great thing because I'm a community manager. Um, they have uh, the most incredible communication about their various resources and their paths to success that I have ever seen. If you go and look at these folks' about page on their website, you will see a video telling the history of the project. Remember, as I was discussing before, the importance of sharing that common heritage. Uh, they have what is OpenMRS, where are the developers located, what are all of the resources for learning how to uh, get involved in the project, what can I do to help OpenMRS as a section, and then those resources are linked throughout the rest of the site. But on their, about, on their single about page, they hit all of the high points to make sure that their paths to success for anyone who would like to come in and help the project are abundantly clear. And last but not least, uh, as a community, they clearly articulated a value of the importance of sharing knowledge, right? Um, everyone in the community is encouraged, and in fact, some folks have even had it in their email signatures. If you learn something, pass it on. This is the most important thing that we can do to build community. And the value of sharing knowledge freely and uh, making it a virtuous circle, right? I've, I've spent some time early on in the project history advising these folks about how to structure their community. And I still get calls from the project leads telling me about this great thing that they learned from so-and-so at a particular organization or uh, something that they learned that was a great lesson from their community that it, they thought might be useful to me and may be able to be helpful in my work. So these are all of the reasons why I think these folks have seen the kind of phenomenal growth that they have and have been able to be so successful. So last but not least, I'd like to leave us with one parting thought. Um, beautiful gardens happen in unlikely places. This is a vertical garden um, on the side of a building. I want to say it's in Portland, but of course I think it's in Portland. Uh, I've found that during my time as a community manager, um, particularly now that community management and thoughts about community are something that we are uh, thinking about uh, sort of more in the forefront of our 
community processes, that um, you know, a lot of the things that we say, we say over and over again. Uh, a lot of the best practices and, and lessons learned that we share are things that we've all heard before. But I think it's really important to never think that we know what community is or how to build a really great community. Um, I find that some of the most effective lessons that I have learned from uh, working, with free software, working with free software communities have actually come from contacts that I have in the political activism and social justice space, uh, folks who've done labor organizing. It's amazing to me where I find these lessons that I'm able to make useful in my work working with free software communities. And I would encourage all of us as we're thinking about how to make our communities grow and thrive to be willing to take those lessons from wherever we might find them to help make our communities better. And that, my dear friends, is all. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, or should I not be depriving you of the opportunity to have a coffee? Yes, sir. Yes, it's working. OK. I see everything addressed as black and white. So good plans, bad plans. But actually, open source free software communities are a collection as well of the most antisocial people that are also the best computers. <laughs> So how do you address that? You cannot prune them out of communities. Well, I think that, the, OK, so that depends. Um, uh, so one thing that I have noted is that certain communities are more antisocial than others. Um, I happen to hang out with a lot of kernel hackers because I'm a bit of a curmudgeon. But I've also noticed that kernel hackers sometimes tend to be a bit more antisocial than, say, oh, I don't know, web developers, right? Um, and I think that the, that's a matter of, of thinking through Again, your project's goals and non-goals. If you're not interested in growing your community beyond the folks who are already working on your project, you have nothing to worry about. If you're working well together and some of you are antisocial and some of you are not, it's not a problem. Um, if you are looking to grow your community more and all of you are antisocial, you're probably going to have a problem with that and you should find one of your nice perky community manager friends to help you with that problem. And that's okay, they can talk to the humans so you don't have to, which is awesome. Um, or, you know, if you find that someone in your community is particularly cantankerous or difficult or uh, cranky pants, don't let them talk to people. You can tell them it's okay. You don't have to answer that question. You don't, you, in fact, you don't even have to talk to anyone in IRC. You can just hang out and we'll handle the people part. And that really, I think, is the only possible solution to the problem, right? It's, it's about knowing your limits, right? Like, I know that there are days when I'm not really in a fit state to try and be like nurturing and helpful and that's okay on those days I'm not nurturing and helpful I just hang out and get stuff done and then when I'm up for it later then I do it and for some people that's never going to be a position that they're going to be happy or comfortable in and that's cool then it's just a matter of finding someone in your community who can take on that role and is comfortable with it and you know let those who are more antisocial be antisocial over there that's cool we still love them they just don't have to hang out in the limelight and therapy is good too you can send your developers to therapy. I perform unpaid therapy as a community manager constantly, and I am willing to perform unpaid therapy as needed for your project. Other questions, folks? All right, let's all go and enjoy a coffee. Thank you very much for coming.